This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, well, depending on where you are, good morning. Um, thank you so much for being here. My name is Natalie Hennigan, and I'm the education manager at Rethos, Places Reimagined, which is the host of this event series. I'd like to give you a bit of an introduction to Rethos first, um, and you can go to the next slide, Kelly. Um, Rethos is a regional nonprofit organization headquartered in St. Paul, Minnesota. We lead and inspire people to connect to places and promote community vitality. Essentially, we help people and communities reuse and care for their old buildings. So our policy staff advocates for legislation and ordinances that make it easier to rehab buildings and reuse building materials. Our Main Street program works with communities throughout greater Minnesota to revitalize their historic downtown districts. And our education program teaches people how to repair and maintain old buildings. So our education program, um, which you can see some scenes from here on the screen, has a strong focus on reuse and sustainability. We teach our communities uh, basic repair skills so that they can rely on their own skills and affordably fix up their homes. And we promote practices like salvage and deconstruction uh, to ensure that quality materials stay in use. So year round, we host hands-on workshops, webinars, talks, and panel series like this one. Uh, so you can find all of our upcoming programs at rethos.org. And we have a really robust uh, calendar of classes this spring and summer. This panel series is funded in part by a grant from the National Trust for, the Hist for Historic Preservation, for which we are very grateful. It funds not only this event, but um, two following panels in this series. Uh, if you haven't already, I hope you do sign up for the next two sessions. Um, next week on the 11th, same time and place, we dive into the climate and environmental impacts of deconstruction as a demolition alternative. And in particular, we're gonna focus on how communities can incorporate deconstruction into their climate action goals. Then on May 18th, the following Wednesday, we're going to talk about the relationship between deconstruction and preservation, particularly how advocates in both fields can help each other out, and how salvaged material can be advantageous to ongoing restoration projects. All of these events are free, open to everybody, and will be recorded for future viewing. So we have some reminders um, for today. Please, um, we ask that you stay muted throughout the uh, presentations and discussion and use the chat feature for all of your questions and reactions. The first hour or so will be presentations from our expert panelists. We'll take a quick stretch break because two hours is a long time to be sitting. Um, and then we'll have some moderated discussion and open it up to questions from you all. If you'd like to turn on closed captions, you can click live transcript at the bottom of your screen and then click show subtitles. There are a lot of people in this call from all over the place and we're already hearing from you in the chat. Um, please continue to introduce yourself to each other. Uh, so far in my limited experience, um, deconstruction I believe has advanced in Minnesota because of networking opportunities, cross-sector collaborations and unlikely partnerships. So please do get to know each other. On to today, our panelists uh, represent public, private, and nonprofit sectors, and they're advancing deconstruction and sustainable building practices in Minnesota. I'm so grateful to know them and to learn from them, and grateful for all of their support in developing this panel series. Today, you'll hear from Melissa Wenzel from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, Jason Burble from Better Futures Minnesota, Olivia Cashman from Hennepin County Environment and Energy Department, and Joe Bauman from Krauss Anderson Construction. First up is Melissa. Melissa has worked for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency for nearly two decades, and she currently works as the agency's Built Environment Sustainability Administrator. Her current focus is on creating systems-wide change within the building material management system. With key stakeholders across the state, Melissa is working to prevent construction and demolition materials going to landfills by encouraging preservation, reuse, repair, and recycling of building materials. Previous, previously, she was the state's industrial stormwater program coordinator. Over the years, she coordinates project-specific sustainability efforts within the agency and as a volunteer within her community. She lives by her work motto, human being first, government employee second. Melissa, I'm going to pass it off to you to get our uh, panel discussion started. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, we'll take it away. Thanks, Melissa. 
Thank you, Natalie. Appreciate the opportunity to present today. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for that great introduction, Natalie. Melissa Wenzel, Built Environment Sustainability. And I'm going to talk to you today about high level re related activities going on here in Minnesota. But first, let's take a look. No, that's okay. You can go to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, around the United States, we generate a lot of municipal waste. <clears throat> we also generate twice as much construction demolition debris as we do municipal waste. And think about all the different programs that we have for recycling, for organics collection, drop box, things like that. We've spent decades focused on that. We haven't been doing so on the built environment and yet we generate twice as much debris according to EPA 2018. Next slide, please. So we have a lot of redevelopment happening in Minnesota. And generally speaking, that's a good thing. We need houses, we need places to put people. Pandemic has obviously changed where people might be working, but it doesn't change that we still have a housing deficit. But construction demolition waste is bulky and a lot of it do does get sent to the landfill, especially for demolitions. But con construction projects too generate a lot of waste. In general, we're not focusing on what we can do to reuse those materials and we really should. Next slide, please. We literally are sending entire houses to the landfill. And a lot of materials, yes, cannot be reused or there isn't a market for it. But one house can be up to 200 tons of waste and we have thousands of houses being demolished. Understandably, not all, house can be, not all houses can be reused, but there are a lot that can and might need some encouragement for reuse or repurposing. Next slide. Rightfully so, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency was uh, asked the good question, well, do you know what is going to landfills and how much, what types of materials? So in 2019, we actually had a construction demolition material study done, and we determined that we actually are sending quite a bit of reusable, potentially recyclable materials to our landfills. So things like roofing shingles, concrete, wood, brick, things that actually do have markets are going to our landfills. You can check out our 2019 report on our website. Next slide. Um, a lot of states, a lot of cities have a waste management hierarchy, material management hierarchy, but a lot of us uh, entities are not following the, what is called the new waste management paradigm. Preventing and reducing waste should be our number one goal, but we don't necessarily have programs, policy, or even requirements that reflect that. Uh, with landfills still being the number one source for a lot of our building materials, we really need to rethink what we're doing if we truly want to prevent and reduce waste uh, around the built environment. And you'll see from the speakers today, you'll, you'll hear from them on how we are collectively and individually working towards some of these goals. Next slide. This is kind of a busy map but it is a true system of our built uh, material management system. And I'm happy to send this slide to anybody who wants a copy. I do have it uh, emailable, but we actually do have a, a circular loop within the built environment if we choose to follow a path of circularity. You know, we can reuse materials, we can repurpose buildings, and a lot of people are doing that these days. So we can keep materials in use, whether it's whole or individual types of materials. But bottom line is we actually do or could have a very robust uh, management system here in Minnesota, but it does take efforts and you'll hear from those efforts later today. Next slide. So what is deconstruction? Uh, this will be obviously talked about by those that actually have experience doing it, though I've de deconstructed a thing or two. Uh, sounds good, I'll be happy to send you the slides, Z Christine. So deconstruction is really unbuilding of buildings. Sometimes it's called construction in reverse. And it's been done for a long time. We didn't have the luxury of throwing away buildings until post-World War II when we started to build buildings that were cheaper, easier to make, um, and uh, more plentiful materials available. So before then, people built buildings to last. And since then, people are starting to build buildings to last. But that's even still a trend that is a little harder to get people to conceptualize. I was speaking with a couple of instructors at um, Summit Academy. They teach construction courses. The two instructors I talked to actually teach unbuilding. 
to the construction students because you know customers change their mind. Somebody might build something wrong and they have to reuse those materials either on the existing job site or a future one. And so teaching unbuilding is actually part of their construction training. And uh, that's something I just found out earlier this year. And it makes a lot of sense when you hear it, um, but it is something that not everybody knows how to do. Next slide. So what are we doing in Minnesota? Next slide. We've been interacting with a number of cities who are very eager to implement best practices within the built environment. So a couple of weeks ago, a few of us on this panel actually presented to a bunch of cities, counties, and other government entities inside and outside of Minnesota about what sort of best practices could be implemented at the city level and at other government entities. So even before that workshop, these are all the cities that actually have documented on the Green Step Cities website as having some sort of built environment best practice. And so if we're having these cities really take effort that does demonstrate that other cities can too, inside and outside of Minnesota. Obviously other governmental entities can, uh, but it does take every part of the state and many of us working together to get these things accomplished. Next slide. So a lot of the effort is actually on redevelopment and reuse, and that's by design. A lot of cities do have really well-made buildings that are no longer needed for their existing or their previous reason. And it might be easy to think about taking them down and building something new. But a lot of cities across the state are actually thinking about how to repurpose buildings. So I've seen two examples in the last year where a bank has turned into apartment complex and a bank is turning into a children's museum. So South St. Paul and the city of St. Cloud are re rethinking how to use their particular banks for new purposes instead of tearing them down. So I kind of figure if those cities can do it, other cities can because there's probably a lot of banks that are hitting that um, end of life at this point. Next slide. I just picked a few of the best practices for Green Step Cities for the built environment. But again, reusing buildings is a really good goal, uh, something that a lot of cities might be able to do or might be able to encourage through financial incentives or other opportunities. Um, but it's something that you can reduce waste when you have a building um, being repurposed. You know, Think about those materials that could be reused or recycled instead of thrown in the landfill. Saves people money not having to have things taken to landfill. And then also support organizations that focus on green job training programs like deconstruction training. That's a really good one to focus on. Next slide. Sorry for those that have heard this recently or uh, several times. It's a success that I really like. And it's not necessarily about deconstruction, but it is a very important part of the conversation, which is about material markets. So Becker County up in Northwest Minnesota, pretty small county in terms of population, they actually started two years ago, um, a goal from 20 years ago, diverting materials from going to their construction and demolition landfill. Somebody's like, you know, some of the stuff going to our landfill is actually in really good shape. Some of it's brand new. There is actually a lot of new waste from construction sites. And wouldn't it be great if we could divert those materials and, you know, get them back in public use? So they started a pilot in September 2020 where they actually tried once every two months to, they, they did succeed in hosting an actual sale of materials that they pulled and diverted from the landfill. So I do know of some other programs across the nation that have something like this, but their county actually still charges a tipping fee for the materials coming in because they don't know if they can uh, repurpose them or save them for sale. And then they charge money to the public for, for selling those items. So they get paid twice for the same materials. Pretty brilliant idea if you, if you ask me. So they make money and they divert materials from the landfills. And I don't have any recent numbers. So these are numbers from last year and the year before, but uh, that's just a snapshot in time. And they're just one small county and one small county landfill. So if they can do it, I think others can too. Next slide. Here's some of the materials that they've been able to divert. 
and kind of the lessons learned from their staff who are more familiar with just handling waste is that their staff are now recognizing when things have value. So when they first started this program, the uh, workers were saying, oh, that's just junk. We don't think anybody would want it. And now they're seeing what has been sold over the last two years and they have a very keen eye on what is repurposable, what is able to be fixed and what is selling. And uh, they're kind of becoming uh, reuse material experts in a sense. So change does take time. Uh, but empowering staff to make some of the, these decisions and uh, helping to realize the value in things goes a long way. Next slide. More materials. What strikes me about that lower left photo with all that lumber is that there's actually construction companies that are actually taking brand new materials straight to the landfill for reuse. So they know that they're still being charged a tipping fee, but they know that these materials will actually have a, a use versus sending it to the landfill for sticking it into a hole in the ground. And so they actually have uh, arrangements made with this construction company to bring surplus materials uh, to be used in the, the reuse sales. So they feel good knowing that their materials are getting repurposed or, or given a first life, let alone a second life. And the county obviously benefits through these sales. Next slide. Emily Barker is the Reuse Minnesota Executive Director. She, when she was with the city of St. Louis Park, helped coordinate a building material collection event. And it's something that the, through Hennepin County, the county that St. Louis Park is in, would like to host again. Um, I've heard potential interest from Dakota County. I'm encouraging staff within Ramsey County to consider it where I live. But the idea of hosting a building material collection event would really give a large opportunity for residents, small businesses to donate building materials that they don't need. And partnering with nonprofits that actually sell these materials like Better Futures Minnesota, like Habitat for Humanity Restore, it's a great win-win idea. And so Emily actually hosted uh, a 10 minutes or, or recorded a 10 minute video when she was unable to present in person about what it takes to host a building material collection event. So I can dig up that link and share it in chat after I'm done speaking. It's a really great uh, concept and she gives some lessons learned on how to host a good one and, and things to avoid. So uh, I highly recommend checking it out. And like I said, I'll share it in chat in just a moment. Next slide. Here in Minnesota at the state level, we understand that we need to lead by example. And I can understand how difficult it might be to convince uh, people to consider reusing buildings if we're having the same difficult conversations at the state level. And uh, not all buildings can be repurposed. And so some of our conversations are learning about what it takes uh, to keep a building in use, but also why buildings cannot be reused. And we are uh, opening the door to conversations about future buildings. Can we talk about a, a building and its functionality? Can we talk about potential use, reuse, or worst case scenario, can we talk about deconstructing the building materials? And those are conversations that we've been um, positively and actively working on in the last two years, more so recently. And we're actually having really good success as far as conversations going to talk about how the state of Minnesota manages buildings at the end of their current life. So that is a to be determined work in progress, but it does actually help me recognize that it is really complex when there are competing needs or issues for a specific building. So for those of you out there that are like, oh, pie in the sky, state government. No, I, I get it. I, I'm having those conversations too. Next slide. On a more positive note, the University of Minnesota has a sustainable systems management program uh, that students can get their degree through, their undergraduate degree through. And a group of five students actually completed their capstone project, I believe it was last week, where they actually assessed the end of life of this specific building called the Ben Pomeroy Student Alumni Learning Center on its end of life with the potential demolition, deconstruction, or preservation of this building. They did comparisons of not only cost and time, 
but worker safety for those three management methods, uh, carbon impacts, uh, materials lost or saved, uh, workforce development with that activity and other comparables. So it's a really, really great opportunity to learn how one particular building could have had multiple ends of uses and what those impacts could look like. So this particular building was built in 1907. It was renovated in 2007, and it's likely going to last another 100 years. But the students did want to understand what, what would be lost, not only including the building materials, but the history of the use of the building if this building was either deconstruct deconstructed or demolished. So they are just wrapping up their final paper. We hope to be able to share that on our website. And if not on our website, uh, I, I do have a, a copy saved in a Google Drive. So I'm happy to share it to anybody who's interested. Next slide. Kind of going back to the, do we know what materials are going to various places? Do we know what's being reused and recycled? And we really don't because we don't require that. So we have been listening to what cities have been asking of us, and they've asked for us to create a template or a draft form that they can implement at the city level for waste management plans, for demolition, deconstruction projects, construction projects, renovations. And it's not a requirement that we use it or that we create this. It's not a requirement that cities use this, but it's a tool that cities can use to find out where materials are going in their city. So a lot of cities have zero waste goals or climate resiliency goals or just basic solid waste master plans. And this can be a tool in their toolbox either for their own city owned buildings or for any project within their city uh, that has waste generated for the building materials. So we are working with a contract and we'll have a final product at uh, the end of summer. Next slide kind of a slightly outdated photo, but we, uh, we're looking at ways that we can categorize materials, uh, capture the materials by reuse, recycling, or landfilling, and find out where they're going. Um, you'll notice that we're not telling people how to manage the materials. We're just asking people to report what they did with their materials and where it went. Next slide. So there's a couple things you can do. Next slide. First, there are a growing number of deconstruction organizations out there. And this doesn't even include the number of construction companies or general contractors that can salvage or skim um, some of the uh, higher quality, lower, uh, harder, easier to access. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, higher quality, easier to access materials like light fixtures and appliances, wood trim, uh, good quality materials that are a little easier to pull. So a lot of companies can do that in addition to general contracting work. But there's a number of companies and organizations that actually literally focus on deconstruction. Little caveat for La Crosse, uh, that is obviously not in Minnesota, but they do service the Houston County area and very small county in Southeast Minnesota. But I still feel like it's worthy to say that we do have deconstruction activities going on there. Next slide. I think today is supposed to be some sort of big launch for this, but I've kind of lost track if there's a news release or not, to be honest. But there is, for the first time ever, a nationwide tool that anyone in this meeting can use. And this tool is to allow us to lift up and celebrate and list people who are connected and organizations who are connected to the reuse ecosystem. So we've never had as a nation, and actually this is North America wide, so if anybody from Mexico or Canada are here, you can use it too. Um, but we've never had a system where we've had the same terminology, consistent um, phrasing and categories for our built environment system and having a map-based system so we can find them. So again, kind of like that lacrosse example, just because they're in a different state doesn't mean that they won't service uh, Minnesota. Minnesota. And same thing for other states is that these resources can be listed so that it's not a mystery who is a part of the system. Let's normalize who is a part of the build reuse system by having a map based searching tool that we can all use. So go to allforreuse.org and look for the ecosystem map. 
and it's something that anybody can use and there's kind of a thank you natalie there's also a check and balance so if you know it doesn't meet a certain criteria there are people behind the scenes that are checking i'm officially in charge of all the minnesota ones and i have some homework to do because i have a huge list of organizations i'd like to list next slide you can also attend our quarterly minnesota built environment meetings we started these uh, last September and we modeled them after similar uh, meeting opportunities that the Bay Area has, that the Northeast has, the Northwest has of the United States. Um, but these are words that the, the attendees feel connected to when they hear the word, the built environment, uh, the phrase, the built environment. So we welcome anybody anywhere to attend. And uh, the next slide will have information about where you can find links to this, these meetings, but they're all completely open to anybody. Um, the next one is in June. And if you sign up for our sustainable building and construction and demolition materials management, link i know that's wordy but uh, we're also managing landfills which is a whole nother issue here in minnesota um you will get those updates so i have a draft going i'll be sending it out uh, early next week so i'll have the the information for our next quarterly meeting within that newsletter and next slide uh i did remember after submitting these slides i was just gonna say i forgot where to uh, i forgot to include my um agency's web address on there. So thank you, Natalie, for that. Please feel free to connect with me. Like Natalie, I'm a huge believer in making connections that working together and not reinventing that wheel can further our goals exponentially. So please reach out to me, share with me what you're working on. Um, I'll be happy to share with you some of our other developments and you're just gonna have a great day listening from others speak today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. I've had the privilege of um, being in quite a few webinars and conferences and gatherings with, alongside Melissa. And every time she presents, there's a new update to some initiative in Minnesota, which um, is a really powerful thing. Uh, so thank you, Melissa, for always being on top of what's going on and sharing um, uh, what you're working on. So um, we're gonna do a little screen switcheroo as I introduce our next uh, panelist, Jason Burble. Jason Burble is with Better Futures Minnesota, and he has been facilitating deconstruction projects for homeowners, businesses, and government clients since 2016, with hundreds of successful large and small projects. In 2017, he landed and then led Better Futures' largest single project, the full deconstruction of a 21,000 square foot residential home in Hennepin County. In addition to leading Better Future Minnesota's deconstruction sales efforts, he also consults for and owns several reuse businesses. So thank you so much, Jason, for being here and representing Better Futures. I'll let you um, introduce yourself again, thanks. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Melissa, that was great. Um, nice to see, see some familiar faces in the crowd, including, uh, at least three of my colleagues from Better Futures. So, hey guys, um, I think a nice uh, segue is to just maybe hit the video right away and we'll use that to introduce what Better Futures does from uh, the deconstruction and uh, resale standpoint. Hi, I'm PJ Hubbard and I am the vice president of the Business Alliance here at Better Futures Minnesota. Since 2007, Better Futures Minnesota has been doing some remarkable work around welcoming men that have experienced the prison system back into the community and most importantly, back into the lives of their families. In partnership with the men, we provide stable housing, nutrition, life skills coaching, trainings and certifications, as well as jobs. These jobs are at the core of the success that we've seen over the past 15 years. Our largest job creator is in deconstruction services and the resulting building materials that we divert from the landfill are then sold in our 20,000 square foot reuse warehouse at 2620 Minnehaha Avenue, located in Minneapolis. I'd like to introduce you to Quinn Jenkins to explain what deconstruction is and how it supports businesses, homeowners, and the overall environment. Thanks, PJ. Hello, I'm Quinn, and I manage the deconstruction business line here at Better Futures Minnesota. Deconstruction is essentially disassembling the house by hand so they can be reused or recycled. 
Uh, deconstruction can be small as salvaging kitchen cabinets, countertops, and appliances, or taking apart an entire house by hand, including the foundation. It's also an excellent option for commercial properties that will benefit from keeping materials out of the landfill while supporting a great local nonprofit. The process is easy and risk-free. We start with a site visit, make a list of items to be salvaged, and we provide you with their pricing for our services. The salvage materials are considered a donation to Better Futures Minnesota, which is 100% tax deductible. Once we provide you with a quote, you decide if you want to use our de deconstruction services. We perform the work on your schedule and the donated items are brought back to Tino in the warehouse for sale at, to the public. Hi, I'm Tino and I manage the Reuse Warehouse Retail Store. Once the deconstruction items arrive to our location, my team prepares them for sale to the public. We are open Tuesday through Friday from 9 to 5 p.m. and Saturdays from 9 to 4 p.m. Our customers are DIY, homeowners, contractors, local artists, and hobby crafters. As you've seen, we have a massive selection. You can also check us out online at reusebfm.com. Thank you for investing the time to get to know Deconstruction our reuse warehouse, and what we do here at Better Futures Minnesota. If you are interested in a deconstruction consultation, please call us at 651-335-7700. Or just stop by the reuse warehouse and see what you find. Awesome. <laughs> uh, that's a new one for us and uh, it's just nice to see it. And I'm glad everybody got to, got to do a quick overfly of what we do at Better Futures. Um, I would say maybe a quick history, and then I'll talk just a little bit about the uh, a quick history of how deconstruction got here through Better Futures. Uh, we're one of the main stories, I guess, um, of the modern deconstruction movement here in the state. When Better Futures started in the in the uh, aughts, um, there was the idea of a population of uh, men that that needed. Uh, needed some help transitioning out of the prison system. And uh, our organization uh, in conjunction with Hennepin County um, found, a, found a solution and they knew that that solution was around jobs, housing, and we've come to learn it's around uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and coaching and counseling as well. So that is uh, for any of you who are in the, in the, um, in the, nonprofit world that are serving people. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is one of those things that got added to the equation after we got running that's been a real game changer. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about Ecotone Partners uh, later on in the presentation. They're a measurement company essentially, and they're the ones who kind of uncovered the fact that, you know, um, housing people is great, uh, giving people work is great, um, lifting them up is great, but until you hit that cognitive behavioral therapy button in the in the overall approach, um, you you really start to see some dramatic improvements. And dramatic in that I'll throw some quick facts about our organization that I believe is accurate, but I'm close. Um, our average uh, profile of uh, the men that uh, come to us voluntarily is uh, three or more felonies and they're uh, in their early 30s. And the typical recidivism rate of someone with that profile is very high. It's it's a it's it's a it's a very high number. Um, with cognitive behavioral therapy, our our recidivism rate has gone to be a very low number, single digits of the of the uh, men that come through our programs uh, reoffend. Uh, so it's it's been quite uh, powerful and. Uh, and so it's uh, it's an organization worth getting behind. Um, so the deconstruction. So way back in the aughts, when when we were looking for jobs, what kind of jobs are guys with this profile going to be able to be successful with immediately? And uh, we have several business lines, but deconstruction was one of those that we went out on a national search. Our founder and and uh, the supporters of the organization said what is out there? What, what can we do? So deconstruction popped up early. It's been uh, in practice in a lot of uh, West Coast cities and in a giant practice around Chicago and Cook County, Illinois as well. Um, they brought these ideas back to uh, Minnesota 
and said, well, we have a great market of older homes. Um, and, uh, you know, we have men that want to work. And, and so that's kind of how it started for us. And it uh, was always something that was building, 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 because much like when our organization started, there wasn't a lot of talk around people, you know, who were coming out of the prison system and how to get them reintegrated and welcome them back in the community. And quite frankly, there's a ton of stigma around it. And we think now there's le a lot less stigma and that's thankful, you know, that's, that's partially because of Better Futures, but everyone has been talking this direction as well. And um, so, so that's the, the early, the early, um, the early, early part of it. Um, and we were doing a, a handful of projects a year you know, we would do some, we would, everyone get excited and sell a big deconstruction project and literally would take months to accomplish. And we were kind of learning on the, on the uh, fly. And uh, we spent a good amount of years sort of promoting the idea, landing the first couple of sales and getting people out in there and working on it. And uh, I joined Better Futures in 2016 as a outside specialist and how to, how to, find more of the market. And uh, since 2016, we've, you know, we've gone from doing a handful of projects a year to more like 40 to 70 projects a year. So um, we've gotten uh, bigger, faster, better at it, less expensive, uh, which is all, uh, all good stuff uh, in the community. Um, the, uh, you know, so this all comes around the idea of, you know, why throw away a house? And so this is a really good graphic that that breaks down individual components of a house and what their carbon offset is if you reuse or recycle them. Um, so that's always a good graphic to look at an exploding house. It's not quite how it happens, but it goes through you know every single item that uh, that works through on a house. Um, I think the best way to uh, talk about deconstruction, uh, I think Melissa gave you the quick basics. I'll give you the quick basics again, and then we'll just dig into some individual projects, which I think are going to answer a lot of questions and really talk about what it looks like in the field um, for deconstruction. Um, all of the examples, let's see. Okay, so uh, deconstruction is taking things apart by hand. So uninstalling and uh, using hand tools uh, to take things apart so that they can actually be reused. So clearly when you hit something with a clamshell, uh, uh, you know, heavy equipment, it gets smashed up and pushed into dumpsters and it becomes very small, which is, which is great because it takes up less room, but obviously there's a better alternative. So taking things apart by hand, um, we typically will, uh, you know, I'll talk through, uh, I guess I'll go through the um, examples first. So the most common, I think what everybody, this is what I think of when I think of deconstruction and what's really happening in our market right now, um, but it might not be what everyone else is thinking about deconstruction. So I would say our most common um, full deconstruction project is a 1920s era house in a place like uh, South Minneapolis, Linden Hills neighborhood, or Edina. So that's about 1800 square feet. And uh, it's just, it's a, it's a cute colonial home or, a, or, a, you know, maybe a 1950s rambler or something like that. But basically, 1800 square feet is about um, the average uh, full deconstruction that we see. And so what does it look like? Um, as it says in the video, essentially, we come out there at the beginning, we walk through with the homeowner or a contractor or a realtor, whoever is helping to kind of represent the, the uh, person that's tearing this house down. And we make a full list of everything that's gonna be salvaged. So um, we'll go through and make a full list. We'll take pictures of everything and we'll have all that information uh, compiled and we'll do two things with it. The first thing we'll do is we'll send an agreement uh, to the homeowner that says, hey, this is what we're gonna salvage and this is what we're gonna charge. Um, and at the same time, we work with outside appraisers, which there's, <laughs> uh, 
there's uh, people that specialize in building material appraisals specifically for donation. So um, unfortunately, to my knowledge, we don't have anyone here locally who does it, which is kind of weird, but we don't have a local appraiser that does that type of thing. So we have uh, appraisers all over the country that we connect our customers with that are completely separate from us. Um, we send that list out with all the pictures and that list in pictures, they're able to do what's called a desktop appraisal and they'll punch it through their computer and they'll say, hey, this is gonna come back at a value of X for the donation. So the customer is gonna get um, that number immediately within a couple of days before we start anything or anybody spends any money. And then at the same time, they'll have their, uh, they'll have their um, cost for doing so. Um, we'll come back to the financial piece of it because I think it's extremely important. My experience uh, with the projects that we've looked at over the years is that it's very difficult to do this without some type of subsidy. So we'll talk about money a little bit later, but we'll go through the house first, kind of from top to bottom. So on a full deconstruction, this you know 1920s house in Minneapolis, um, we start with a full interior salvage. So we'll go through um, and we'll take out uh, the, the, the things that come to mind immediately are things like hardwood floors and taking those out so that you can have them for reuse is a, is a, is a, is a patient skill that the, that the guys learn. Um, and uh, those boards need to be denailed, they need to be bundled and, and prepared. So all that happens on site. And then we kind of work our way around. Um, we cut, uh, if, we can, if we can get a door fully out with the jam so that it can be reinstalled whole in the next place, we do that. Otherwise, we take the slabs out um, and all the lighting fixtures and all of the things that uh, are inside the house, interior full deconstruction is the first step. Then typically we switch to the outside. Um, one of the challenging things about residential construction and construction in general on the commercial level is um, stucco. <laughs> and so taking stucco off the outside of a house is an incredibly time consuming bummer because it's not, uh, it's not reusable. Um, so it's gonna go into the, uh, it's gonna go into a recycling dumpster. Um, good time to talk about recycling dumpsters for a minute here. We have two companies that are dealing with recycling um, of, of building materials uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, Atomic is the one that everybody sees their green dumpsters. They have a processing center for it. And Demcon um, down in the Shakopee area, they also are doing that. Um, I've toured Demcon, it's a great one. If anyone has an opportunity to tour Demcon, they should. Uh, it's fun to see how the recycling actually happens um, and uh, what they've been able to accomplish there. So now we're, now we're into the exterior. We're taking the, we're skinning it. Hopefully it has a wood siding um, or an aluminum siding, uh, but we take that apart. And then basically uh, it's time to jump up on the roof and de-shingle the house. So um, this is a nice time to talk about the first thing that the men do uh, before they ever jump on the job site is go through full OSHA training. And uh, safety is a massive part of what we do. So. Um, so their, so their certifications are around um, OSHA safety training and, and that sort of thing. And once they hit the job site, safety is a daily uh, conversation and something that the job supervisors are constantly on the lookout for. Uh, it's a, it's imagine being on top of a roof, peeling shingles off. Um, you have to be tied in, you have to be um, in teams so that if there's problems, you can, you can uh, have someone to, to help or a call for help. Um, and so you're taking the shingles off and then you start to take the decking off the roof and uh, you take the, the uh, trusses down and basically you start to peel the house from top down until you hit the, uh, the foundation of the house, the basement most commonly. And, um, and, we're, and that is about where we end. We leave the foundation in place that's a heavy equipment uh, uh, removal at the end of the job. And, um, and uh, typically on a full deconstruction, like the one we're talking about, we time it so that we finish our part 
we leave a basement foundation that is pretty full of debris because one of the things we've learned is that if we punch holes in the floor, uh, we can get stuff uh, into the foundation quickly rather than have to hand cart it out to the uh, recycle dumpster. So there are things that are not recyclable like drywall um, uh, and lath and plaster that go into the foundation, but that's basically how we, uh, how we finish it. Um, I'll talk about a couple more projects because I think that um, I think that there's a lot of misconceptions around you know what kind of stuff should be salvaged or could be salvaged. I'll pop I'll pop into the next um, what I think is the most uh, the biggest opportunity for all of us, which is your standard kitchen remodel. Um, tons of people have their kitchens remodel, and it always involves new cabinets, countertops and appliances typically. And this is something that we've really developed over the last year or two uh, in conjunction with, um, with the general contractor partners that we have. And um, people are becoming aware that before, before, we, before we were here and we were promoting this, as I'm talking to new people, they're, every single person says the same thing. Oh, these cabinets are, are fine, they're useful, but, um, they used to end up. They used to end up. They used to end up in the dumpster, and I still think that the majority of the time they end up in the dumpster because the reality is that everybody wants to do the right thing by saving them, but there's just not time and market demand and appetite for them. So putting things on Craigslist for free works, of course, but um, setting stuff out on the curb does not necessarily get the job done. So on these small projects, oh, I'm gonna talk about the financial part of it too, sorry. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this financial um, part of it. So like on a kitchen, the remodel, um, I would say that for us to come in and do a deconstruction of a kitchen for a remodel, it's typically call it a thousand to $3,000. And when you send the kitchens out for appraisals, you end up with 10 to $40,000 for a kitchen. Uh, is what the donation value is worth. So um, those are the numbers on a small project. Um, I'll go to a bigger project and then I'll try to explain the, the financial part of it um, for a private homeowner. So on the first house I talked about, that 1800 square foot house in Edina or South Minneapolis that we're talking about, those typically appraise at somewhere around 100,000. We'll use that as a, as a round number. Um, uh, my understanding of the appraisal is that it's a combination of resale value of individual components, replacement value, and just national averages overall. So, you know, whenever I tell someone, well, the house is going to, you know, it's probably going to be 100000 for a donation, they think, wow, that's, you guys are really making a lot in your warehouse. And that's not necessarily the case, um, but it is a legitimate number. And the appraisers that uh, that we use refer people to are licensed. They're monitored, you know, monitored uh, from the federal government. And this is a big national trend that's been in place for 20 years. The IRS has seen a bunch of these types of donations hit people's personal returns. And my um, my uh, research from the national experts says that if you're doing a donation. Uh, of up to $400,000 of building materials that is zero impact on whether or not you'll be audited. So not something scary at all. It's IRS is completely used to it. So on a $100,000 donation, um, you know, if people itemize their taxes, if you're at a 35% bracket, uh, you save 35 grand on your taxes after you do a deconstruction project like the one we're talking about in South Minneapolis. Now we are probably going to charge somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty-five to thirty thousand. So what happens is that if you do the quick math, you can do the right thing and you can actually end up money ahead. Um, and you know people are at higher tax brackets than thirty-five, quite frankly, that we work with, and so it's typically a pretty good financial transaction for folks. But in this case, it's being subsidized, right? It's being subsidized with a tax incentive. Um, and, uh, I will, uh, there's some other stuff that's out there in the community, uh, Ramsey and Hennepin County both have 
deconstruction grants that uh, that Olivia is going to talk about. Um, so there's ways to make this affordable, um, and that's the big part of it. So I think I'll pop on to the next one, which is the uh, next case study, which is the big one I mentioned earlier um, in my bio. Uh, we did a project in 2017 that was a 20,000 square foot home uh, out in the Western suburbs. And the reality was, it was built in 1992. It was, uh, it was a dream home for someone. And the, when they moved out, someone else moved in and said, gosh, this house is way too big. Like they had three kids and they couldn't find their kids. It was a 10,000 square foot uh, Rambler. So one level with a 10,000 square foot walkout lower level. It was a gigantic house. And so this house was just loaded with building materials and very super specialty high-end stuff. And so, you know, some examples of specialty high-end stuff, like in the inside of it, there was hand-hewn beams uh, just completely across the entire first level that uh, were done by a father-son team out of Norway or somewhere in Scandinavia. I mean, these were incredibly artistic and very expensive when they were installed. And we were able to salvage every one of them it was uh, it was a safety check, honestly, because the beams on ceilings, uh, at least these, were bolted from the top, and so we're up in the attic area, uh, um, uninstalling these bolts. And when the bolts were uninstalled, the beams would hit the floor, and the beams were 150 pounds a piece. So it's having people uh, in the right spots and being careful with it. But that was a, a cool part of that project. Um, and there was just tons of goodies inside, including like a wine cellar that was, that was, uh, we were able to deconstruct and reuse and, uh, a golf simulator and just tons and tons of cool stuff. Um, the outside I thought was even more interesting, um, on the house, the, uh, the, uh, starting with the cedar shakes, I mean, 10,000 square feet of roof line that was all cedar shakes. So guys were up there peeling those off. We we uh, put them in uh, Gaylords and we shipped them back to the warehouse and people bought them like crazy uh, because it was early at the time it was early in the um, the chicken coop rage and so people were buy were building uh, chicken coops and these are the kind of customers that we get they're looking for building materials on something that is uh, that's a, that's a different take on it and uh, those shingles were great on the chicken coops um, and then uh, we also did. It was a crazy amount. There was maybe a hundred thousand um, antique brick pavers uh, in their driveways surrounding and patios surrounding the house. So hands and knees, stacking bricks for days on end. Um, big logistical challenge. First of all, finding a market for that many bricks was very challenging. We ended up selling a lot of them on um, Craigslist. We sold them through the warehouse, and uh, we we shipped from. Uh, we use a trucking company. To ship directly from the site, which was really, which was really efficient and good. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about that house that was really cool was that uh, uh, I found a local gardening nonprofit, and all of the perennials that uh, that they had been growing for 20 years, uh, we were able to to run some uh, some free perennial grabs. So we had we uninstalled the plants. And we got them, uh, we got them ready to go, and people came out and, and grabbed a bunch of perennials. So that is the uh, that is the um, so that was that project. I would just say that uh, most people think when they think deconstruction, old houses falling down, and I would say it's kind of the opposite from what we've seen. Um, very common to have a project like that. We uh, we do a lot of stuff on. Lake Minnetonka, where it's just, you know, 2000, early 2000 built houses that are getting completely gutted down to the studs and rebuilt. And, uh, and this is a way to keep all that stuff out of the landfill. And so the, 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 the old houses, which is, uh, which is what people think. And one of the things that people don't think about is all the framing lumber. So any of the framing lumber from the 1960s back is all Douglas fir, which is uh, very durable, good stuff. 
And then when you get to the older, older stuff, you can actually get into the um, the rough sawn lumber, which is extremely, you know, they call it truly dimensional lumber, which is extremely valuable. People want it in the market. And, uh, you know, this is stuff that people, uh, it's th that people chop trees down and, and didn't professionally mill the lumber. And we do a number of projects every year where the houses are built in, you know, that last two decades of the 1800s. And when you get down to the framing lumber of a house, um, that's what you get. And it's just incredibly beautiful and, and people love it. So uh, I will talk a little environmental impact and I'll give, uh, I'll give uh, some, some props to Ecotone Partners. They're a local company. It was kind of born out of a partnership with Better Futures, honestly. Um, the founder is very close to our founder uh, and they were looking for a way to, uh, um, they're looking for a way to measure all of this. And so briefly what Ecotone does is they take peer reviewed research and of any type of measurement and they crunch a bunch of reports from different peer review uh, research and they come up with numbers. And so here's the carbon offset and an example of what a person gets when they're done with a project with Better Futures. They, this is a summary of you know, what we reclaimed, um, what we, what we uh, diverted and uh, you know, including the landfall stuff and they talk about net totals here and the carbon offset. And when you get to this, um, I would just make two points and I think this is a preaching to the choir point, but um, reuse is the biggest bang for the buck. And so when you're talking about doing a kitchen remodel, um, you can do a zero, you can do a completely zero waste um, kitchen remodel by just uh, working with us to, uh, to get those back into circulation. Um, and I would just say the other part of it is that the Ecotone makes his reports, I think, very approachable because they take the actual data from a project and they, uh, they turn it into things that people understand. Like, you know, this project was, the, was effectively uh, taking 10 cars off the road over the course of a year, or it's the equivalent of 50 trees or, or whatever. So it, it, it puts it into real, into real, uh, into things that people are understanding. So I think that puts us at a good spot. So thanks everyone for your attention and time and um, connect with me if you have a project and uh, thanks for supporting us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jason. That was excellent info. Um, and I think Melissa already shared in the chat a link to that Why Throw Away a House poster. Like Melissa, I share that one a lot. Um, it's super valuable and, and nice to look at. So um, thank you so much, Jason, for that. Um, we're moving right along. Uh, and next panelist is Olivia Cashman. Um, Olivia is the Environmental Protection Specialist with Hennepin County's en Environment and Energy Department, where she works to promote reuse and recycling of construction and demolition waste and ensure proper disposal of hazardous building materials. Olivia coordinates the county's recently developed deconstruction grant and pre-demolition inspection programs. Olivia has a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science from the University of Minnesota and prior work experience in environmental health and safety in manufacturing industries. Um, I'm so excited for Olivia to share about the really innovative work that Hennepin County is doing to support deconstruction um, in our community. So thank you, Olivia, take it away. Thanks, Natalie, and thanks, Rethos, for hosting this webinar today. Such a um, great uh, opportunity to talk about deconstruction and excited that there are so many folks in the audience today. Um, so like Natalie said, I'm Olivia Cashman. I work for Hennepin County's Department of Environment and Energy. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Our Environment and Energy Department serves over 1.2 million residents. And the goal of our department is to protect land and water, take action on climate change, promote environmental stewardship, and then reduce and responsibly manage waste, which is uh, the unit I'm housed in. And my focus is on construction and demolition waste and looking at ways to reuse building materials. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so this morning I'm going to talk about some recent developments that Hennepin County has taken on over the last couple of years. Um, we've you know, been working for um, about a decade with Better Futures Minnesota, like Jason had, had mentioned, um, but just in the past couple of years have really um, taken a closer look at what we can do as a county to encourage deconstruction. Um, and I think it's super important for governments to walk the talk around sustainability. So that's why I wanted to start um, my talk today about an internal construction and demolition waste policy that Hennepin County has been developing over the past about year and a half or so. This is an internal policy that um, different impacted county departments would need to follow for different renovation, new construction and demolition projects, as well as road, bridge, and other transportation projects. Um, currently, this policy is in a um, sort of trial phase where we're working with various departments, such as our resident and real estate services team, um, our facility services team, transportation folks, et cetera, um, just to see how um, the policy will actually kind of look on their projects. And a few examples of some of the guidelines that the policy entails includes um, requiring deconstruction for any residential single family home built prior to 1955. So an example would be some of the county's tax forfeited properties and then requiring uh, recycling on any for any non reusable debris. So as Jason mentioned, using Atomic or Demcon or that would also include source separating on site to um, advance recycling of those materials. So we are hoping to have the policy finalized in the next month or so, uh, but just wanted to mention that um, internally, we're looking at how we can uh, push the bar forward with our various groups. And this internal waste policy also aligns with the county's overarching climate action plan, which sets out different strategies and outlines to reduce greenhouse gas emissions associated with buildings and energy use um, with the large goal to um, get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And more information about the Climate Action Plan is on the website listed here. Next slide, please. So next I'm gonna talk about our pre-demolition inspection program. This is essentially a program where staff walk through properties, both residential and commercial, prior to them being slated for demolition. So we're notified about um, demolition permits from various cities in the county and then coordinate a time to go and inspect with the contractor. Uh, this program was started uh, with a huge help from our colleagues over at Ramsey County. They've had a similar program for over 10 years. That's been very successful. Um, so they helped us in Hennepin County build our own program. So just a note that this work is taking place across the Metro. And items we're looking for in these inspections is anything hazardous. So things like appliances, asbestos, electronics, uh, fluorescent lights and other mercury containing items, paint, pesticides, um, those sorts of things. Um, this is a requirement from Hennepin County ordinance and also Minnesota state law. Uh, but not only are these inspections helpful for removing those hazardous materials and protecting public health and the environment, um, but they're also really, really great opportunities to talk to demolition contractors and city staff about uh, possible deconstruction on these properties and reuse options. And they are just a great tab to know what demolition work is happening in the county. Uh, for example, a couple months ago, I was notified about a um, city owned project in New Hope that was slated for demo and asked if deconstruction was possible and they actually had Better Futures go out and take a look and um, had deconstruction done on it. Um, we've also had situations where um, doing the inspection saw a lot of great usable material and had a salvage, another salvage organization come out and pull material before it was demoed. So really great opportunities to, to talk with folks um, before a building's demoed. Next slide, please. So we've already talked a lot this morning about um, deconstruction, what deconstruction is and how it works. So just wanna quickly reiterate some of the many benefits. Um, not only is material diverted from the landfill, but makes 
the building materials available to the community for um, you know, use into a second project, provides jobs as it has been talked about, supporting reuse retailers and the circular economy. Um, something that hasn't been mentioned is that there is a reduction of dust compared to mechanical demolition um, by using deconstruction and then also preserving historical building materials and keeping those in the market. Next slide, please. So we know that deconstruction, while it has all these great benefits, it does take additional time and labor and that as well as cost can be a deterrent for folks to choose that instead of mechanical demolition. Uh, so because of this, back in February of 2020, Hennepin County launched a pilot deconstruction grant program offering up to $5,000 to residents to use deconstruction techniques. Um, we've been really excited about the response from the program so far. And since 2020, we've awarded over $108,000 from 26 projects. We also have a few more underway so far for 2022, which I'm really excited about. Uh, these projects have diverted over 930 tons of material from the landfill, uh, including over 300 tons that were diverted for reuse, so put back into the market for other projects. We have funded one full house move, which I'll talk more about in a few slides and have received over 70 applications. So seeing a lot of great interest in this program. And then finally, uh, this program received the Deconstructor of the Year Award from the National Build Reuse Organization last fall. They are a national nonprofit that brings together folks on deconstruction. And I just wanna note that because it's a testament to all of our partners, uh, folks like Better Futures, um, Habitat for Humanity Resource that are doing the work, as well as our partners at MPCA, Rethos, Reuse Minnesota, um, and just the, the energy around deconstruction in the state. So I was really excited about that. Next slide, please. So for the grants, we do have various criteria to ensure that the projects we're funding divert a substantial amount of waste from the landfill. Uh, some of the requirements include um, removing a minimum of five different interior fixtures. Uh, so things like plumbing, uh, toilets, tubs, um, bathroom vanities, uh, kitchen cabinets, and uh, windows and doors, et cetera. Um, and then we also have a separate category that's more focused on lumber. So that includes wood flooring, actual dimensional or structural lumber, and then ceiling and floor joists. And next slide, please. Also wanted to note that um, Ramsey County has their own deconstruction grant program that launched just a couple of months ago. So really excited to see funding expanded across the Metro. Uh, we often get calls from folks from outside of Hennepin County that ask if they can apply for funds and you know we have to keep our funds in Hennepin projects only, but it's great to see Ramsey open it up. So there's a link to their website if you are located in Ramsey and, and want to talk to them more about that. Next slide, please. I have a few examples of uh, grant projects that we've worked with recently. The first one is a partial deconstruction. This was on a um, 1940s house in the Linden Hills area of Minneapolis. Um, this project worked with Better Futures and removed items like um, bathroom fixtures, hardwood flooring um, to divert over six tons of waste from the landfill. And I think partials can be a really good um, introduction to deconstruction. So this is kind of the um, selective salvage where you know maybe it's not feasible for the project for whatever reason to take the entire house down, but getting into the habit of removing these interior fixtures before um, either renovation or before a full building removal can be a good way um, for contractors to kind of dip their toes in and, and try out the practice and see that it is feasible. And then, you know, maybe on the next project, they go for a full deconstruction. So um, I've been really pleased with the interest in, in these as a kind of step stone to, to push deconstruction forward. Next slide. Uh, this is the full house move that I talked about earlier. 
This project involved physically relocating a 1900s Victorian home from the near north neighborhood of Minneapolis to the Jordan neighborhood about a mile and a half away. Um, this property was slated for demo for a new uh, multifamily apartment development. And uh, some of the property owner took it upon themselves or they actually bought the property for a dollar and um, worked to get it moved. And there were a lot of hurdles, um, both with the city level and with utilities. Um, so it was a really good project to kind of learn more of the ins and outs of house moves, but it was a great project. It diverted over 220 tons of material um, and they're currently working on uh, building out the new foundation at the, at the new site. Um, so I was really excited about this one. Uh, and again, these are just two examples and other organizations that we've worked with on grant project are Bauer Brothers Salvage and the Birch Group. Next slide, please. Uh, so the grant projects, inevitably, some of them um, include material that is not reusable, and we require that any non-reusable material go to a construction and demolition recycling facility. Uh, so these are facilities like Atomic and Demcon uh, that have been mentioned already today. Uh, they have equipment that can sort materials by type, um, and they can recycle up to half of the materials rather than if they went straight to a landfill. So these are a really great way, um, not only on our grant projects, I, I recommend it to folks that reach out um, just wondering how they can increase recycling. Um, and it's also a good way to re um, support recycling markets in the state. Next slide. I'm really excited to end uh, the presentation today by announcing an expansion of Hennepin County's grant program that we're really excited about and just got our Hennepin County board approval to move forward on. So uh, this is hot off the press. Um, we are going to continue funding the residential deconstruction grant projects at the current rate of up to $5,000, um, so $2 a square foot, that's based on eligible deconstruction expenses. Um, but we're gonna expand and include commercial properties uh, for deconstruction as well, up to $10,000. Um, and then we are going to increase funding for structural moves, seeing uh, the high amount of waste diversion from those projects and increased costs as well. And so separating out that into its own kind of category. And then finally, we are adding a um, grant for used building material installation. So that's essentially if folks are doing a remodeling project or a new build and they wanna incorporate salvaged and used building materials into their new designs, these funds will um, go for offsetting the labor effort and time to incorporate those building materials. So for example, um, if someone was shopping at a um, used building material retailer and wanted to get a vintage sink, maybe reclaim hardwood flooring, um, you know, some hardwood doors to install, th these are what the grant funds could be used for. Um, and this tier could be used in conjunction with the other, or one of the other three tiers. Um, so if a project was deconstructing, but then um, in the new design, incorporating different salvage materials, it could um, kind of be used in both ways. Um, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, we're really excited about uh, the launch of this kind of expanded grant program later this month. So stay tuned for updates on our website. Um, we're hoping you know that the additions to the program help close the loop in the uh, building material reuse atmosphere um, by you know, in increasing demand for these products while also continuing to help incentivize deconstruction um, for that supply side. Um, so again, our website is listed here. Uh, the next slide has my contact information if you have um, specific questions or wanna talk more or maybe have a project um, that you're thinking about, um, I'd be happy to talk. So thank you so much. Thank you, Olivia. The timing of the um, expanded grant program is perfect. It's so exciting to share that information. And I know that was developed um, in partnership with lots of stakeholders and, and you received so much positive feedback from the original iteration. So it's excited to see it. It's exciting to see it grow. 
Um, our last panelist uh, of, of the series today before we dive into questions, and don't worry everybody, I've been keeping an eye on your questions, so we will get to them um, after, after Joe uh, shares his perspective. So our last panelist is Joe Bauman. Joe is the Director of Self-Performance at Krauss Anderson Construction Company. Joe brings decades of experience in the construction world. He ran his own company for 24 years. Uh, in 2012, he became a lead accredited professional and tried to incorporate as many sustainable techniques into his work as possible, including sorting for diversion and salvage. Now at Krauss Anderson, he started uh, their new department of self-performance and has significantly decreased the amount of construction debris going to landfills by using extensive sorting and material salvage processes. So we're excited to have Joe share his perspective um, from the commercial construction sector. Um, so thank you, Joe, for being here. Go ahead. Thanks, Natalie. Can you hear me okay? I was a little behind on getting my uh, my mute turned off. All good. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's still morning, I guess. Uh, uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to present on kind of on behalf of the uh, private construction sector and kind of give uh, at least my personal point of view and on, on, as we talked, uh, you know, on my perspective on the how these things affect the commercial construction business. So if we start with the next slide. So we talk about what's the typical mentality in commercial construction. The typical mentality is first of all, just wreck it as fast as possible. Uh, that's it, get in there, get whatever equipment you can. Um, the theory is always equipment is cheaper than, you know, perfect people power. So get machines in there, wreck it as fast as you can. The next step, dispose of it as cheap as possible. So that again, that was the mentality. That's just the the facts of this business is okay. Now we got it down. Now how can we get it out of here as quickly as possible? That's to get it in as big of boxes as you possibly can. Mix things together. Not worry about any kind of sorting or salvage. Just get it off the site. There's not enough uh, money in the sorting and salvage to offset the additional cost of doing that. So. And then the, the third phase was uh, just to go out and move on to the next job. So it literally for decades has been that simple in the commercial construction industry. Unfortunately, there, there were really no incentives for commercial companies to do it any different than that. Uh, that's one of the thing that's, things that we hope to change in the near future is, is to create these incentives. And that's what all these things are about you know, better futures and the grants and all these other things. What can we do to incentivize these companies? Um, part of that though, and, and my feeling about it is just, you know, it's kind of our responsibility to do it at this point in time. You know, when I became a lead AP uh, in 2012 and just for my own business, I just thought, well, it's a good idea. Let's see what it really takes. And, and it, if you get those systems in place and you train the people, it's really not that difficult to at least do the sorting and some significant diversion. Uh, and then now that you do have the companies and we in commercial work with Atomic and Demcon all the time. So it's not, they don't just work with the residential companies. We work with those companies consistently and they have a report similar to the one that was just shown that shows what they divert and where it goes to, you know, what, uh, how they sort it. So even the things that we don't sort ourselves on site they will dump it there. They're called transfer stations. If you're not familiar with it, they bring all the stuff to their transfer station. They dump it all out on the ground. They put it on conveyor belts. And it's fascinating if you ever want to go to one of these facilities and watch it. And people hand pick the debris off this conveyor belt and sort it. So it's, it's just really a cool deal. And it's just when you look at it, you go, oh boy, it really doesn't take that much more to do that. And it's just the uh, diverts a tremendous amount of material out of the landfill. So that's happening on a pretty regular basis in commercial construction now, at least, especially if it's a LEED certified project. Uh, and there are more and more of those. LEED certification, unfortunately, is a fairly expensive process as well. It adds about 20 to 30% to a commercial construction project, at least a new project. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, different requirements that it takes to be LEED certified. And there are also different levels of it. 
Um, if you wanna to go to the next step, the next slide. So, you know, we talked about uh, what was typical in the construction business. So the next question then is, well, what would we like to see? So the first thing we'd like to see is to deconstruct these buildings. And actually I used the wrong term, deconstruct and reuse because we're not essentially altering the material when we deconstruct. Uh, so the second step would probably be to salvage and repurpose. That's where the other <laughs> word comes in more correctly. Um, and then the third one would be to sort and divert from the landfills. Those are all things, again, that, that we are trying to do more and more, at least at, at our company, Krauss Anderson. We know there are other large general contractors, commercial general contractors that are doing this on a more regular basis. And if you get used to doing it on the lead projects, it's not that hard just to continue it on other projects. And that is what we try to do here. Uh, if you go to the next slide, we're talking about, uh, you know, what are some of the barriers? You know, why aren't more people doing this? Or, or why isn't it a bigger uh, part of the commercial construction industry? And, uh, you know, again, they're, they're really pretty obvious, at least to our, in our business sense of trying to get money to the bottom line. So it, it takes more time, so it costs more to remove these materials by hand. The next item would be that uh, the lack of wholesale markets. Um, there's more and more, again, with Better Futures and, and the Restore and all these, you know, there's other uh, facilities that aren't even nonprofits that also do that. They'll take, you know, um, excess building materials and things like that and, and sell them. So there are, there are more markets coming available. But commercial construction is such a large volume of material that that's still a, an issue for us. Um, the next one would be lack of awareness. Uh, again, it's not trained, in my opinion, into, for instance, college students in construction management classes. You know, how much are they really taught about this? You know, I think that's something that probably in the future needs to increase. Uh, the next question is, uh, lack of training well, that kind of comes to the same thing you know making the commercial businesses aware of, of what's available what they can do and then train those people as well as the students into you know how can we do this in the most efficient manner possible it may not be everything we want to do but again there's certainly things that that people can be trained and educated on that uh that makes sense to do uh, immediately pretty much the next one are transportation costs. Again, you know, to have a dumpster hauled away, let's say it's, even if we sort it, it's still three, $400 per 20 yard dumpster, roughly to have them hauled somewhere. Um, we do like when we recycle concrete, if we separate the concrete out, then we only get $200 because they can haul that to a facility that will take that concrete and crush it and reuse it. So there's different ways that we can save money, even if we don't save the cost of the entire dumpster, we save half the cost of it. So anything we can do that, that, that still makes sense for us to do that. Uh, and then the other thing, there's just many other things. There's a lot of moving parts to, um, you know, trying to sort and salvage and, and deconstruct in the commercial construction business. Um, one of the other things with sorting and, and deconstructing and all that kind of stuff is a lot of the commercial sites are really tight sites. We're looking at one uh, just down the street now, for instance, where there's a, a small parking lot and they're going to put an 18 story building on it. And there's literally no space left. The parking is built into the building. There's seven stories of parking built into the building. We're literally going to have to shut off lanes in the streets on two streets just to get enough room to move in and out of the project. So, so that's a, a real issue, especially in, in downtown areas that, uh, we do a fair amount of high rises in uh, for our business. Uh, so the next step then is, uh, you know, what can we do uh, to remove or reduce these barriers? You know, so uh, again, educate commercial construction companies. You know, we, uh, you know, get involved in this with the MPCA and with Natalie at Rethos. And um, we were just talking early about, you know, my company now wants to do a podcast with the, the MPCA and Rethos to try to, you know, again, get this out, not only in our company, but then we broadcast that on our social media networks and, and hopefully it just helps get that awareness out there. And then once the awareness is there, then people, hopefully we can offer these education opportunities. 
uh, we can educate field workers, um, possibly through union training programs. You know, we can contact the unions and, and again, train these people how to do it. I was thinking earlier, maybe even like Jason's people, where do they go? You know, after they've kind of worked with his company and learned, you know, maybe those are good people to, to contact uh, the union and get in as a union laborer, you know, now that they've got some background. Um, so there's opportunities there. Now they've already got a lot of that background. Um, uh, the next thing to do would be to work with the USGBC, who's the, the organization that kind of oversees the lead certification process. And, uh, you know, Natalie had mentioned, can we talk to them about actually getting uh, so, well, first of all, the way the lead process works is there's all these different things that you do and then you get points. And if you get in a certain amount of points, then you can be, you know, bronze certified, silver certified, gold certified, platinum certified. So can we talk to the lead uh, USGBC to get deconstruction put into some of these projects where maybe it's even not a whole building demo, but a lot, you know, what we call selective demolition, where we could get points for deconstructing and reusing materials. So, you know, that's certainly a, a, another education avenue that we can take. And then the, the last, not the last, but one of the other ones would be to help create markets, possibly through grants and legislation like that has been talked about in some of the other uh, presentations. Uh, the last thing then really, uh, you know, my presentation is a little shorter, but uh, um, if you want to go to the last slide, it's just that uh, the commercial construction business is really slow to change. I've been with Krauss Anderson for about four and a half years now, and it's really slow to change, <laughs> trust me, especially in a, in a big corporation like this. Um, people don't like change, businesses don't like change. Um, so we, you know, we just keep pushing it forward. Uh, again, there's a lot of moving parts with increasing costs and decreasing schedules in our business. Uh, we just built a 12 story building and I don't know what it was like 11 months or something like that. And now we're building another one in nine months it's like the schedules are getting more and more crazy so but that's what helps offset the cost for these owners and gets them to do the buildings nonetheless uh, the more we can do to re reduce the barriers and remove the barriers to deconstruction the more likely that it will become uh, common in commercial construction that will adopt these practices so um, you know i hope the sooner the better and and with these kind of programs and presentations we're i think we're on track to do that so thank you all for uh allowing me to present today and if you have any questions uh, you can contact me at uh, my email address so thank you thank you so much joe appreciate your your uh your perspective here we know that the um commercial construction industry is a huge player in this. And once we start making changes, um, that'll be a really powerful, a powerful place to see that happen. So thank you so much. We're gonna take about a three and a half minute break uh, so that everybody can get a little water and um, uh, get some blood flowing back to their brain. <laughs> um, if you have any questions for our panelists, um, please do uh, add them into the chat and then we'll have about a you know, 25 minute conversation with our panelists. Um, and and answer all of your all of your questions. So we'll come back here at about eleven thirty five.
All right, as folks continue to gather back, um, I'm, I'm reviewing some of the questions that came up in the chat. Again, please do uh, add your own uh, questions for any of our panelists, any or all. Um, I wanna bring up a question that was asked a little bit ago by Aleph. Um, uh, the question is, can you speak to the viability of these types of projects, deconstruction projects in outstate or rural areas where infrastructure might be hit or miss? And I think this is an important question. You know, a lot of us, uh, our organizations or businesses are, are based in the Twin Cities and the urban hub of Minnesota, um, but, but have sort of tendrils or connections throughout the whole state. So how do we support um, deconstruction activity in greater Minnesota? Um, I know there are folks, you know, on this call too, who are from other places, other states, other communities, and might have some um, perspective to share as well. So I'll toss that um, to anyone on our panel, maybe Jason, I don't know if you have any examples from Better Futures projects in greater Minnesota that might be a good place to start. Yeah, thanks. I, that was one of them that caught my eye as well. So thank you. Um, so we've had success in a couple different ways and I'll tell you the other parts of it. The, the success we've had has been with St. Louis County uh, up in greater Duluth area. Um, again, it comes around funding, honestly. Part of it is that um, we did a bunch of deconstruction projects up there over the last five years. And it's a direct result of both funding and, and uh, knowledge. So there's, we've gotten some funding over the years from the lottery money for back, lack of a better word. I can't remember there's an acronym that it's escaping me. Melissa's smiling, she knows it, but. Um, so they, the, the Minnesota lottery has funded in their environmental trust, uh, some of this stuff. And there's some people at the University of Minnesota Duluth that are that are very committed to deconstruction. So we've had success in St. Louis County, and the challenge with that is local labor. And so we've shipped our guys up there essentially, and they've they've done you know a week, two, three weeks of the crack where they're sleeping in the hotels Monday through Friday, and then they're coming home on the weekends. So I find it to be challenging to send our crews there, but it's something that we definitely do. Um, and then. Becker County, uh, we're in the early phases of just continuing to promote it with them. They feel like there's an appetite locally. This is the area up around Fergus Falls and Detroit Lakes. And uh, so we're working with Becker County. Um, I think as a small organization, we've had some success in that we at least have been lending expertise. Like I know that we we're invited down to look at a church in southeastern Minnesota that was, you know, turn of the century, all brick. And had great conversations with them about how do you take this thing apart so that it can be reused. And so we've lent expertise, we've had some success, but I mean, essentially uh, it's the amount of projects and local labor uh, that has always been the challenge. And the last thing I would say is that we've worked with indigenous tribes to provide labor over the years. And so I know that that popped on the chat as well. Um, an outstate person that's doing something around mobile homes and deconstruction in the outstate. So that's my experience. Thanks, Jason. Um, and yeah, Melissa added in the chat in response to a different question about yeah, manufactured homes, um, a greater Minnesota deconstruction company who it sounds like is still doing work. So that's, that's great to hear. Um, I know we hadn't um, weren't sure exactly of that. So um, one question I was curious about is kind of connecting, um, you know, Jason's work uh, with Better Futures and Olivia's work offering um, incentives for, you know, homeowners so far. Um, what have you, what changes have you seen in demand, I guess, because of each other's presence, you know, with the, with the existence of these grants, is there greater demand on Better Future Services, or as Better Futures continues to grow and have a name for itself, is there greater demand on, you know, for this grant program? So I'm curious, you know, how you have, have worked together and seen um, your programs sort of support each other. Yeah, I can um, I can start by just saying that Better Futures has been an awesome partner, and they're always great about if they are doing a site visit for a project in Hennepin County, that would be a good um, contender and candidate for the grant funds. They'll pass them on to us, and um, we'll talk through that. And then, kind of on the flip side, if if I get a 
application in or a resident that's interested in the grant funds, but they aren't exactly sure where to start, I'll, um, you know, kind of send them a list of um, folks to talk with, including Better Futures. So then there's kind of the connection that way too, or then they'll reach out to uh, Better Futures and, and inquire about deconstruction. And yeah, so far this year, I think we've had um, the busiest start for applications. We have seven projects underway right now um, for the grants. Um, last year, it, it was a little bit slower of a start, uh, but yeah, seen really great interest um, so far already this year. And I think it'll be a busy spring and summer for grant projects, but I'll let Jason add anything uh, you all think is relevant. Yeah, I think that it's honestly, it's changed the market and really specifically in one way. Um, like right now, I just got an email from a contractor who is doing two full teardowns in uh, one South Minneapolis, one Edina. And they know that this grant money is available and the way that it's structured. And so it's just an automatic, they hardly, I would say uh, being dramatic, but they hardly even ask their customer anymore if they wanna do uh, select uh, a targeted deconstruction because it's a, it's a free deal for them. So they just handed us two projects, $5,000 a piece, assuming that we can just max out the grant. And, uh, and that just never happened before. And what it does is it, it, it invites a conversation now um, into like, what is a full deconstruction? Because once we go out there and make a list, I can have a conversation that says, hey, this is your full list. This is what it looks like donation wise. This is what it's gonna cost. Have you considered going further than 5,000? And so it's it's really changed the market. And I'm really excited about the commercial side of it because on the commercial end, it's it's a challenge. The money is the is the main barrier. Um, and people still do them, but they can't take donations the same way private homeowners can. And it becomes a it becomes a uh, a PR uh, play, honestly, rather than um, a part of how they do business. So getting reimbursed $10,000, that's a great, that's a great uh, step forward for both Ramsey and Hennepin counties. I'm excited about that. And I think it's gonna change the market dramatically. Thank you both. Um, I wanted to pull out a question that John asked uh, to me directly. Um, if anyone has had experience on deconstructing historical monuments or historical properties, and if there's possible funding for this from any state agencies other than the Minnesota Historical Society or State Historic Preservation Office. Um, and this is something that like, it, it, I feel like there are examples, as I said to him um, again in the chat, of, of more grassroots uh, salvage efforts. Maybe if a historic property is coming down, a community rallies around saving some of the material from that property, which can be a really powerful way to, um, I think, you know, carefully take it apart and reuse, uh, you know, these, these materials that have some historic significance. But I'm kind of throwing it back out to the panelists or anybody in this group who's familiar with a, a project like that, um, you know, where, where something of, of particular historic significance, um, you know, uh, was, was deconstructed and, uh, and was able to, to receive some funds. So I might just like toss that out there in case anybody, um, anything comes to mind. But, um, and, I, and I also- I have one thing. Go ahead, Joe, yeah. Well, I was just gonna say, I have one thing that, you know, I had done in uh, my past history is uh, there's some companies out there, I think one of them that's still around is called Architectural Antiques. And if you have something that's really significant, they'll actually pay you for it and sell it in their store. So it's just one little minor outlet to keep in mind. That's a great plug, Joe, for our third panel series on May 18th, because Ian Anderson from Architectural Antiques will be speaking about um, some of these, these really uh, excellent salvaged materials from historic properties. So um, perfect, perfect tie in there. <laughs> Natalie? Yes, this, hi. This is Christine. I don't have the visual, sorry. Um, in Rochester, Johnny Kriesel, John Kriesel, Kriesel Auctioneering is an individual who's been sort of deconstructing buildings throughout his life. 
Um, I mean, his family settled in Rochester in the 1800s, so there's this long history, and his family were the people who did all the plumbing for the Mayo buildings in the early 1900s. But, but so it's, it's an individual who has done it, and anyone who's ever in this area would be well served to have a conversation with him. I mean, it's the, the lights that are in our rel relatively new city hall building are ones that John had salvaged from a building and kept stored in his barn. You know, his barn is this treasure trove of things. He has signs from all these old buildings, you know, from the 30s, the 20s in downtown Rochester. Um, so I think there are individuals who have done this too, Joe. It's not just commercial ventures. That's a great point. I've heard that name Kriesel before. So thank you for bringing that up. That's that's very cool. Wow. Thanks. How do you spell hit that his last name or do you have a link for a um, it's K it's uh, I'll actually send um, I'll, I'll send the site. He has Kriesel. Uh, it's a store on historic third and I'll put it I'll look up some information and put it into the chat. Okay, thanks. I okay. don't know John. I want to know John. Yeah, he's he's and you you have to sort of make an appointment to see him because he he also is an auctioneer. <laughs> so, yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks for that heads up. I I apologize. I was off. Melissa, you will enjoy him. Um, I'm particularly curious to hear. I just just from scanning the attendee list, a number of folks. Um, working at the city or county level um, in greater Minnesota or even just not St. Paul or Minnesota, St. Paul or Minneapolis. And so I'm curious to hear either in the chat or, you know, feel free to unmute yourself, um, folks who are considering any sort of incentive um, or ordinance program around deconstruction and salvage, um, how, you know, folks like Olivia or Molly Flynn at Ramsey County can, can support, uh, you know, other counties considering similar types of programs. So um, I would love to hear from, from those of you uh, uh, working at that level. And, and maybe Olivia too, you could share if there's examples of, of working with other counties trying to model off um, um, what you've already accomplished. Yeah, I think um, Ramsey County launching their deconstruction grant program is a great example. Um, and we've gone um, kind of back and forth with them sharing resources and ideas. Um, I had shared our pre-demolition inspection program was really built off their existing program. Um, but another way we are interacting with cities um, is through a contract we have with Better Futures that can help subsidize deconstruction for publicly owned properties. So anytime I, I hear about a city owned property trying to work with those folks to, to make it possible, on those projects. Um, and once we have our internal construction and demolition waste policy, I would love to, to share those guidelines with cities and other local governments to see if they would you know, be able to implement something at that level. But yeah, eager to hear from other folks if, if people have something to share. I feel working in this um, feel that everybody is just like cheering each other on and wanting to support everybody however is possible. So um, everybody here on this panel, every, I, I think is, is eager and, and willing to help out. Jason, I see you've unmuted, go ahead. Yeah, I, um, I have some ideas around out state or you know, the, other than the two counties we're talking about. Um, I think that, I think that the, the, the grant program that Hennepin County has with us um, which essentially uh, subsidizes almost 100% of deconstruction project for a residential property, a city owned or a, a county owned property. Um, we're seeing a lot of success with that. So I mean, if uh, I would say I would say that would be a good first start, um, and it's a little bit more controllable. Um, and I think it's easy to look at the the city's housing stock and or the county's housing stock and see like what do we own that's going to come down. And can we fund this thing uh, in a different way? And that's a good way to do pilot programs that way. And then I would also say that for the outstate stuff, like this church that I, I'm talking about in southeastern Minnesota, had the county just looked at it and said, well, rather than the cost of it going to the landfill, what if we put those dollars towards deconstruction on a one-time grant? Um, that might be the solution too. 
So on a per project basis, maybe to let people know you have funding available to help subsidize that, that might be the, the way to go about it um, without having to roll out a full thing because that enables a, a, you know local people to do it themselves and uh, to help offset the cost. Thanks. I think that can also bring awareness, you know, with a one-time funding opportunity, if, if that's allowed at, at local government levels to demonstrate what the, pro, what the work is and how it can benefit. And so even just building a case study might lead to future support and, and, and a voice to be able to speak for funding from either local sources or from the state. Uh, here we go. Um, I have a question from Amanda. Um, as a citizen of the White Earth Band, oh gosh, sorry, um, of Ojibwe, I'm curious about the Minnesota rural community population and how pilots could be funded for rural via tribal communities. if there's any thoughts to provide on that. <clears throat> I would, I have one thought. Uh, in Minnesota, we have one particular tribe that uh, is very economically successful and very th philanthropic, the uh, Mittawakton Sioux community in Prior Lake. I would, I would reach out directly to them and see what they have uh, in terms of funding. Um, they've been great about, you know, funding all types of Things and especially environmental concerns. So, I mean, I, I would look to them as one. I don't know the government side of it, but I know the tribe side a little bit, and I would suggest that might be a good place to start. I attended yesterday's Ramswana, the last day of the two-day conference, and I was curious who the more recent contact might be. So we had a Simeon Matthews as a part of our work group back when we were coming up with ideas and recommendations for how to move the built environment uh, initiatives forward here in Minnesota. And uh, there's a new staff member that I was told to, to reach out to. So I'm gonna contact Simeon to get this person's name who I wrote down but have forgotten at the moment. Um, so Amanda, I did put into chat that I actually do know somebody who will be working for the White Earth Drive very soon, who was a Green Corps member, is a Green Corps member here at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. So. Um, I'm um, wanting to see how I can help further goals uh, on tribal land, tribal nations. So Amanda, uh, I'm gonna put my email address in chat. Feel free to reach out. Anybody feel free to reach out. Yeah, right. So those developments were just uh, made aware to me this week. So some of these things are timing is everything. Uh, Jason, do you have a more recent contact or a different contact at um, Midwalkin and Sioux? I'm sorry, I don't. I, uh, I interacted with their, um, uh, two years ago, I interacted with their, their sustainability experts uh, because mm -hmm. they have tribal properties that they're uh, looking to deconstruct as well. Um, but okay. I don't have a more recent one. I would also, and you popped it in there earlier, Melissa, I'd also say like towards funding, um, the uh, lottery money. That might be a good reach out to the tribes. Very, very, very definitely. LCCMR. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> the other thing is, is in terms of the National Trust and different funding that's been directed, um, because of interest in respect for Indigenous people and understanding takings and other things. There has been a lot more money at the national level directed through the states to um, native populations. Um, and that might be something to sort of partner with as far as deconstructing or, you know, moving in many cases. Yeah, the, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which is funding this series, appears to be um, well, given that they funded this series, appears to be um, supporting uh, the concepts of salvage and deconstruction, recognizing that not every historic property 
will or can be saved in full, um, and that these practices can be um, can be part of a preservation strategy to to reuse and and capture and treasure what we still can. So, um, Amanda, if you're interested in in connections from that like preservation angle, I'm I'm more than happy to help with that too. So. Um, thanks, Kayla, for chiming in the chat uh, about what's going on uh, in St. Louis Park. Great to see, again, that leading by example um, for deconstructing city properties. So that's pretty cool. Um, in our last few minutes here, I, I wanted to, you know, the, the gathering of folks here is, is quite diverse. We have people representing all sorts of different um, sectors and fields. And so I wanted to just ask our panelists, um, if, if you were to tell everybody here to go out and have one conversation about deconstruction, what should they say? Who should they talk to? How do we really continue to spread the word um, about, about you know, this, this concept that I, I, I do believe um, has so much momentum here in Minnesota and throughout the country is going to be the next phase, I think, of, of our waste management strategy. So um, I, I invite you all to just share your, your words of wisdom and, and, and encourage people to get out there and have conversations about, about uh, deconstruction. So. I'll start. I'd just say, you know, in my business, it's just really getting out and talking to your colleagues about, uh, you know, what deconstruction is and, and what it does for our environment, what, uh, how we can, you know, not only do deconstruction, but even just the sorting and, and diverting as much as possible. Uh, tell them a little bit about, you know, what the, the real effects of it are and, and what the, the cost is, which really isn't significant anymore with the, the way that the, the uh, dumpster companies sort their materials. So that'd be my, uh, my first go around with it. Actually related to what E. Christine just put in chat, my recommendation, because I think anyone can take this, is to reach out to your local government nonprofits or other organizations that have like a workforce development or um, have a solid waste plan, climate change plan, climate resiliency plan. Ask your organizations and your local government leaders to support in practice or with funding these opportunities for building material reuse for deconstruction. Uh, they need to hear from constituents, from people who live, work, and recreate within their jurisdiction that they want this, and that'll help drive decisions. So they, uh, local leaders very much depend on uh, people who, who speak up on these topics or on any topic to be able to push forward the uh, agendas. So just know that other people are doing that, and that's why other agendas might be moving forward instead of these. Melissa, may I ask you a question? Of course. Um, do you know Rochester has a grant from Bloomberg? It's for like a million dollars or something to diversify mm -hmm. the building trades to have more, um, you know, underrepresented people working in them, training in them, becoming staffed. And I'm wondering, do you or does anyone have any connections? Kim Norton, the mayor, is one of the people who led that. Mm -hmm. It would help if someone from some of these agencies would contact someone like Kim and say, deconstruction could be part of this effort. You know, it's it's this growing market. And if you took, if you located in, in Rochester and you served Southeast Minnesota, just think of what you could accomplish. Reach out to me, I'd be happy to be involved in that. Okay, I will give you a call. Thank you. Thank you. I think you gave me a nice opening there. Thank you. One of the things I wanted to talk <laughs> okay, about. Okay, Joe. <laughs> um, one of the things I wanted to talk about um, with the conversation that you asked us to have, Natalie, or asked us to talk about is um, underrepresented communities. Uh, as a nonprofit in a competitive environment, you know, against commercial construction companies and, and all other kinds of uh, competitors out there. We are not allowed to classify ourselves as a minority-owned business, and so a lot of the a lot of the funding around and, and the incentives around using those types of contractors we don't qualify for, and so that's a it's an oddball thing, um, but the reality is our organization is predominantly African American, and uh, because nobody owns it we don't qualify, and so there's there's that, and then I would also uh, I would also just continue to hammer on the funding side of it. You know, um, 
Hennepin and Ramsey County, both big counties, the biggest probably in the state. They're generous in their in their uh, cash outreach to make this happen, but maybe something at the state level uh, would be the way to go. And I would model it after what they did. There, it's not income based. You know, those the this thing is already income. The deconstruction is already funded through our taxes uh, if you qualify, but that is not everyone. And so there's opportunity to make it not income based, and there's opportunity to, to spread it out through the entire state. Yeah, all all great points from everyone, and I would just add um, having conversations with colleagues, neighbors, family, and friends. I feel like everyone maybe knows someone that has a renovation or DIY project going on. Um, so, you know, encouraging them, maybe it's just one item they pull out, maybe they're donating a window, but getting them to start somewhere. Um, and then asking contractors where their waste is going is a conversation I have a lot with demolition contractors. And I think it's just such a norm to throw it in a dumpster going to a landfill, but just asking those questions um, to try to get them to think differently is, is what I would add. Excellent way to, to wrap us up, Olivia. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our panelists, to Joe, Jason, Melissa, and Olivia. We're so lucky to learn from you all and, and hear your perspectives and experiences today. So again, um, oh, I was going to share, uh, well, our website one more time so that folks can sign up uh, for the remaining two sessions um, in this panel series the following two Wednesdays. And again, every every part or every uh, panel is going to be recorded. So um, you'll be able to, to uh, review and, and check out ne the next two if you're unable to make them in real time. Natalie, so are you going to mail them. out links for those recordings to the people? Yes, who yep. and they'll be available on our website and all right. of that. So okay. thank you. Yep. Thank you all so much. Have a great afternoon.